Hey, what's poppin' slime? Um, today, we are going to talk about imaginary numbers. Um, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Mr. Barton, I already can't do math with regular numbers. Why are you forcing me to learn an entirely new set of numbers? That's You're just being unreasonable. And I'm here to tell you that I'm not because it's my job to say that. However, I genuinely think that it's not that bad. And I know what you're thinking now. You're thinking, Mr. Barton, you say that about everything in math. And it's true, you know, math is just so easy to understand. That I, I, or maybe it's just because you guys make it look so easy. But today, we're going to go over some imaginary numbers. And I promise I'll make it fun and humorous and enjoyable. And if not, then, you know, you can uh, make your own video and do it better than me, I guess. So imaginary numbers, here we go. So let's start with what the heck is an imaginary number, all right? So I'm going to tell you a little allegory, and I'm sure if you don't give a hoot about the allegory, you can skip ahead in the video um, until you don't see this slide anymore, and then you don't have to worry about it. But until then, I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. So when you were a little babby, you all learned about numbers, right? Your parents started you off hey, you know what, we've got to learn to count, we've got to learn our numbers, because someday someone's going to ask you for your phone number, and you're going to be like, oh my god, you really think I'm so cute? Oh my gosh, here it is, right? But, uh, you know, Snapchat got rid of that, so maybe you don't need to know numbers anymore, but anyway. So when your parents started you off with numbers, right, they said, all right, let's start to count. And they went, oh, hold on, hold on, I can't even count yet. There we go. One, two, three four, right, and then you kept counting, okay? This is a special group of numbers, and it has a name in math. These are called either counting numbers, or sometimes counting, is that spelled right? Uh, sure. Sometimes it's called, this is the real math word, this is the colloquialism for kids that don't like math. Uh, they're in math called natural numbers because these are the numbers that people come up with naturally, right? A long, long, long time ago, people didn't have numbers. I know you're thinking, what a wonderful world that must have been. But if you didn't have numbers, how are you supposed to get that cute boy or girl's phone number? Like, clearly we need numbers, right? So, long, long time ago, they invented numbers. And I think it is probably someone back in the Middle East, uh, like a shepherd or something right because when they had sheep they had to keep track of them and they would say oh uh let me make sure all my sheep are home so i don't get eaten tonight let me let me do a head count except counting didn't exist because there were no numbers so they just you know named them all they're like all right malachi are you here bah. uh is is malachi here bah oh there's malachi all right ishmael bah right and so on and then really after a certain point sheep just look like sheep and you know sometimes ishmael and malachi get confused and they bat the wrong times so shepherds had to just figure out an easier way to keep track of them so they invented numbers so that they could count and go all right i have five sheep one, two, three, four. Oh, I'm missing a sheep. And it doesn't matter who the sheep is, right? They're sheep. Like Malachi, Ismael, who cares, right? It's a sheep. So they invented counting numbers, right? Then people decided that they needed a way to roast each other, right? So the shepherd would go into town and then he'd see the guy from like six caves down and he would go, where are all your sheep? And the guy goes, uh, I have no sheep, right? And he goes, huh, so how many sheep do you have? And he goes, I don't have any sheep. He goes, but no, what number of sheep do you have? How many sheep? And he says, I don't have sheep. Ergo, the number zero was created. And then we go zero, one, two, three, four, and this is kind of a, a bigger group because you can see it includes the counting and natural numbers, but we're adding zero onto there. These things are called whole numbers. Okay, wonderful, whole numbers. But unfortunately, capitalism soon took hold of the region 
and people started trading sheep and some brilliant guy goes all right i i'm gonna i'll, I'll give you some sheep right uh i want to trade you for a cow okay that cow is worth a lot more to me than these sheep so he tries to trade for a cow and he's got five sheep and the guy goes well this thing this beautiful specimen of a bovine is worth six sheep he goes i only have five sheep I don't have enough sheep. Can I can I trade you now and then I'll get another sheep for you later, right? And th this is the first time this had ever happened. And the guy goes, "What in tarnation? How 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 do you expect us to denumerate the fact that you owe me a sheep?" And then we invented the negative numbers. You have negative one sheep. You don't have any sheep, and you're still missing one, right? Now we have integers okay so now we have the whole numbers but we add some negative numbers on the other end so integers contain counting numbers and whole numbers and now i know that you know exactly where we're going with this that's right they invented carts shortly thereafter and there were no road laws of course so the carts would just drive around willy-nilly and one day, this cart just plows through a herd of sheep, maiming them horrendously. There were legs of mutton everywhere. There was wool and cart wreckage and debris and viscera strewn about. So when the guy gets home to count his sheep, he goes, one, two, three, and then, uh, yeah, well, that sheep's missing the back end. You know, it, it's not a whole sheep. You can't expect me to pay full price for half a sheep, right? So then we included fractions and decimals. That's right, your favorite. Oh, Barton, my three greatest fears. I know, I know. So then we have rational numbers. Okay, and rational numbers are actually just fractions. Uh, half a sheep, a third of a sheep, and so on. Okay. Here is where we get the first other set that doesn't go inside one of these other categories. Okay. There are numbers that you cannot write as a fraction. Uh, one of my favorites is pi, which is 3.141592 dot dot dot, and it goes on forever. You cannot write this number as a fraction. This number is not a counting number. When you count, you don't say 1, 2, 3, pi, 4, right? You skip over it. So it's not a counting number. It's not a whole number. It's got a decimal. It's not an integer. It's got a decimal. And I can't write as a fraction. So pi is our first irrational number. And then all of these numbers are the things that you thought made up numbers. You thought, yep, I, I've learned them all, right? Uh, these things are all collectively known as real numbers. So these things, as you can see, kind of through history developed out of necessity, right? There was a problem that someone had to solve that counting numbers or whole numbers just couldn't account for. So they had to come up with a new type of number. So people just make up new numbers all the time. Not, not so much anymore, but, you know, it's hard. You know, you got to be creative. So eventually we got to a problem that we couldn't find an answer for up here. Okay. The question, here's question number one on your homework. What is the square root of negative one? And when you try and do this, most kids say, well, it's negative one. And what we mean by square root is what two numbers do I multiply to get that number? To get that number. Right? How do, what two numbers can I multiply together? And it has to be a repeat number. What number can I multiply to itself? This is worded poorly. What number can I multiply to itself to get negative one? So most kids say negative one, but that's wrong because negative one times negative one is positive one. I want a number times itself to be negative one, 
right? So then kids go, well, what about one? One times one is one, dummy, uh, dummy, you know? So then kids get really frustrated and they go, well, you can't do it. Okay, well, you can do it. You just have to make up an entirely new set of numbers. I don't know why you didn't think of that to begin with. So they made up a new set of numbers and they defined it with the idea of I and they said the square root of negative one. The answer to this question is this new number I just invented called I. And now I lives outside of this real number block. It is a whole different set of number nowhere in this organization structure. It's its own thing. This is an imaginary number. Okay. Um, I'm going to warn you there's another phrase uh, that you're going to need to know. If you have something like 2 plus i, this thing is called a complex number. Okay. It's made of an imaginary number either added or subtracted with a real number. But this thing together as one indivisible thing is known as a single complex number. So if I say complex, I'm just talking about a combination of reals and imaginary stuck together, right? It's not quite real. It's not quite imaginary. It's a little bit of both. It's it's complex, you know, it's it's got feelings of its own. Okay, now that you've heard the whole story, let's go do some math, right? All right, let's investigate some patterns of I really quickly, and then I'll just teach you how to do the math. All right, so we know that i to the first power, just i, is the square root of negative 1. All right, well, what if I have i squared? So what that means is that I have the square root of negative 1 squared. And we all know from our kindergarten algebra class that the exponent and the radical cancel each other out, and it's just negative 1. So i squared is negative 1 the integer, the real number integer negative one. There's no more i, the i's go away, and we now have a real number. All right, well, let's do i cubed. So this, I'm going to write out a little funky. This is square root of negative one times square root of negative one times square root of negative one. All right. But we just saw that square root of negative 1 times square root of negative 1 is negative 1 because this is square root negative 1 squared. Those cancel. So this is negative 1 times this thing. And for simplicity, I'm going to call this thing i. Okay. Negative 1 times anything just changes the sign of the anything. So this is positive i times negative 1 makes it negative. This is negative i. All right, and once more, this is going to be square root of negative 1 squared. That's two of them. I need two more times square root of negative 1 squared. If you're confused about this, ask me later. Okay. So here's two of my square root of negative 1s. Here's two of my square root of negative 1s. But we already know what negative 1, the square root of negative 1 squared is. That cancels, and it's negative 1 times that cancels is negative 1. And we know negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. So we're back at having a real number. So you can see it goes imaginary, real. Negative imaginary, real again. So it kind of alternates back and forth. Let's see if the pattern continues with i to the fifth. Um, we know from our exponent rules that i to the fifth, same thing as i to the fourth, times i to the first. And we know that i to the fourth, we just found that out, it's right there, it's one. So this is one times i. One times anything is just the anything. So this is i again. Isn't that crazy? i to the fifth equals i to the first. This was completely baffling to me the first time I ever saw it. I was blown away. This is an idea in math called closure, meaning that it comes back to itself and just repeats. Um, if you keep this pattern up, it becomes pretty obvious after like seven or eight of them that you just make groups of i to the fourth and then look at the leftover stuff. So if we look at i to the sixth, 
This is i to the fourth power times i squared. i to the fourth power is still 1. It's not going to change. And then i squared is over here. It's negative 1. So 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. So we're repeating again. We go i, negative 1, negative i, 1, i, negative 1. The next one is going to be negative i, and then the next one will be 1. And then I'll keep repeating over and over and over. So you really just need to memorize these first four, or at least be able to remember this process to figure it out. But you should have the first four memorized. i equals square root of negative 1. It's i, whatever. You know what I mean. i squared is negative 1. i to the third is negative i. And then i to the fourth is positive 1. And if you have these four memorized, you're probably good until you go to college. Wonderful. All right, so now that we know what i is, where it comes from, and we know kind of the pattern when we raise it to exponents, let's go do the math that you have to learn. So we're going to start with the three easy math operations, adding, subtracting, and multiplying. Um, and I'm just going to show you three examples. Um, before we start, though, I want to be very clear on something. I is not a variable. It's a number, right? It's it. I doesn't change values. It doesn't vary. It's constant. It stays the same forever. So I doesn't equal two ever. That's not that's not a thing. We're not looking for I. We know what I is. I does equal the square root of negative one, and it will forever. Okay. But when you do adding, subtracting, multiplying, and then on the next slide, dividing, it helps to act like it's a variable because it behaves very similar. You group things with like terms. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We need to do 2i times negative 3 times 5 minus 2i. So we're going to do order of operation just like you do in all your other algebra. So we're going to do our multiplying first. So 2i times negative 3. When you multiply numbers together, real and imaginary and complex, it doesn't matter if they have i's or not. You treat it kind of like a variable. So you multiply the numbers together, and then the i's, if you're multiplying them, they just gain exponents. Like x times x is x squared. i times i would be i squared, right? 2 times x would be 2x, though. So 2i times negative 3 negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, and then the i doesn't have another i to multiply to, so we just bring it down. Then we have 5 minus 2i. And now, because we have a single term multiplied to a binomial, meaning there's two terms inside the parentheses, we distribute the coefficient to the terms in the binomial. So we multiply the numbers. 5 times negative 6 is negative 30. And then we bring down the i, because there's not another i here to multiply to, so our exponent doesn't change. Negative 2 times negative 6 is positive 12. And then i times i is i squared. If you leave it like this, it's going to get marked wrong on all of my tests, because you need to simplify this. I didn't spend five minutes explaining this pattern to you for you to not use it. So the rule is for writing your answers in the most simplified way possible, i cannot have an exponent on it. So we need to get rid of this i squared. i squared is equal to negative 1. So let's go replace it. This is negative 30i plus 12. And it's multiplying to the i squared. So it's multiplying to the negative 1. So 12 times negative 1 is negative 12. Now, complex numbers also have a standard form. It should be real numbers then the complex numbers. And this isn't really supposed to be like a cent sign. It's a double C, but it's hard to draw. So this negative 30i needs to go at the end of our complex number. All right. Let's look at the second example. We have negative 2 plus i times negative 2 minus i. Before we start going, I need to tell you the name of these these have a special relationship to each other because they're the same thing except the i's are opposite signs. These things have a special name and they're called conjugates. 
It just means that the second term of the binomial has the sign switched. Other than that, they're the same. Special name, it's called a conjugate. So just like with x's, if you have two binomials multiplied together, you have to foil them together, or you have to distribute, kind of depending on how structured and anal your math teacher is. I, I tend to say foil because that's what my math teachers said, but you know. So we're going to distribute this here. So negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. Negative 2 times negative i, a negative times a negative is a positive, and 2 times i is just 2i. i times negative 2 is negative 2i. And then i times negative i is negative i squared. Again, I'd like to reiterate that i's are not variables, but treat them sort of like them for the sake of doing your math right. These are like terms, so 2i minus 2i cancels out because they cancel, right? Positive 2 minus 2 is 0, so 0i zero goes away. Now we have 4 minus i squared, but remember we can't leave exponents on our i, so we need to simplify this, and i squared is negative 1, and now we can simplify negative negative 1 to plus 1, and 4 plus 1 is 5. So next time you're at work and you have to tell someone that it's $5 for whatever they're trying to buy, just say, yeah, that'll be negative 2 plus i times negative 2 minus i. Because it's the same thing, you know, it's 5. All right, one more example. Uh, oops, I can't slide. All right, so same thing. Uh, it's just not going to be a conjugate this time. So we're going to FOIL, or we're going to distribute. So 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times 4i is 8i. Negative i cubed times 3 is negative 3i cubed. And then negative 4i cubed plus or times 4i is negative 4i to the fourth. All right, let's start by cleaning up these i's to powers before we get ahead of ourselves. So I'm just going to bring down these two terms, 6 plus 8i i to the third, remember, is negative i. So this is negative 3 times negative i. And then i to the fourth, remember, is positive 1. So this is negative 4 times 1 is negative 4. Okay. Negative 3 times negative i is going to be positive 3i. So we have 6 plus 8i plus 3i minus 4. Now, the real numbers are like terms, so we need to combine them. So 6 minus 4 is 2. And then the imaginaries are like terms, and we need to combine them. So 8i plus 3 more i's is 11i. Make sure it's in standard form with your real part first and your imaginary part second. All right, now here's the, the big kid math, right? This is where you were, this is what you were waiting for. Barton, give me something I can impress my friends with, right? And then they all laughed hysterically because they would never brag about math to their friends. But, you know, one, a teacher can dream, right? So to divide by complex numbers um, is very similar to dividing by fractions in that we just don't do it. We avoid the problem entirely. Um, if you try and divide by a fraction, Right, if I have like 2 divided by 2, come on, you son of a gun. Oh, man, this is why you shouldn't be YouTubers, you guys. Divided by 2 thirds. You don't do that problem. What you do instead is 2 times the reciprocal of this, and you get 6 over 2, which is 3. Okay. Okay. So similar to fractions, we don't divide by a complex number, we're going to multiply by 1 instead, except it's not so easy to just multiply by the reciprocal. We're going to multiply by that fancy word you learned on the last slide. We're going to multiply by the conjugate of the imaginary part, and you'll see what happens. So to divide by 7 minus 2i, we're not going to divide. We're going to multiply on the top and the bottom because I need to multiply by the same thing, right? I'm multiplying by a fancy 1 here. Uh, the conjugate of this, 7 plus 2i, 7 plus 2i. 
you see anything divided by itself is one. So I'm multiplying by one, so I'm not changing the value, but it'll, it'll work out. So distribute our three. So three times seven is 21, I hope, plus three times two is six, bring our i along. And then on the bottom, seven times seven is 48. Seven times two i is, sorry, I lied. Wait, no, it's not Mr. Barton. It's 49. Okay, seven times two i is 14 i. Negative two i times seven is negative 14 i. And then negative 2i times 2i is negative 4i squared. Okay. Just like on the last example, do you see how these middle two terms cancel out? That's a special thing that happens when you multiply by conjugates. We're doing that intentionally because it cancels out the i terms. It gets rid of them entirely. No, it doesn't, Mr. Barton. There's an i squared right there. Yeah, but we're geniuses, and we know that i squared is negative 1. So negative one times negative four, this becomes positive four. And then 49 plus four is 53. On the top, we just copy this thing, 21 plus six i. And now you're gonna say to me, Mr. Barton, this looks like dog duty. And I can't say I disagree with you, but at least the i is on top now. Um, this is kind of like we wanna rationalize denominators. You're gonna remember like, 16 years ago or something when you were born your mom taught you that seven over radical two is a big no-no in math so you multiply the top and bottom by radical two to get this thing uh no that's a two right this is called rationalizing the dom denominator um this isn't irrational so i guess this would be called realizing the denominator but that doesn't make a lot of sense in english so we, we just call it making the denominator real or multiplying the top and bottom by the conjugate. So again, if you have to divide, don't. Multiply by the conjugate instead on the top and the bottom. All right, and now you guys are masters of imaginary numbers. So hopefully your homework is pretty straightforward and doesn't make you want to drop my class. Um, but if it does, let me know all about it. I eat up the misery of students. So tell me all about how much you hate it.